Hello from uh, Centre for International Forestry Research, uh, C4. I'm here on the campus um, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in Johannesburg for the, uh, for the mixed session on Prunus africana, but I do welcome the opportunity to be able to share with you the results of some of our research on the species. Um, some of you, if not all of you, have seen um, our PowerPoints over the last year or so, um, looking at and condensing, distilling the research results that we've been generating for over the last few years. Um, and we have a fairly strong message that we'd like to convey um, about the sustainability of Prunus africana to you this afternoon. So Prunus africana um, is a very interesting uh, species. Uh, it occurs in a genus of over 200 species, but is the only representative found on the African continent. It's, uh, it occurs primarily in isolated montane populations across Africa, tropical Africa and Madagascar. And these um, populations are isolated to the extent where the populations themselves are both genetically and chemically distinct, uh, making each individual population incredibly important for conservation and for genetic, genetic conservation as well. The species is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN and is also listed on CITES Appendix 2. So it has a level of protection um, across the continent. However, the species is threatened through to, due to habit, habitat loss, due to clearing for farmland, particularly in some of the more uh, populated areas of, of montane forest. Um, and future impacts predicted due to climate change have been recorded by a number of authors, um, with these montane uh, forest fragments being particularly susceptible to climate change. The commercial trade um, in Prunus africana originated from its um, herbal, uh, local and traditional use um, for various ailments but it's used primarily as a remedy for benign prostate hyperplasia. And this affects more than 60% of men over, over 60, um, with a slight swelling of the prostate. And the herbal remedies provided by Prunus are one of the few on the market that is relatively efficient. However, since 1970, uh, Prunus africana bark harvest has shifted from subsistence use to much more large scale to feed a growing international trade and a trade that's worth roughly 200 million dollars a year. There are very few alternative products to Prunus africana although there are some including saw palmetto from uh, the United States and there are many emerging markets particularly in Asia um, and China and India in particular um, the demand for Prunus africana products has been reported to be increasing. So in terms of the history of trade of Cameroon, uh, this slide shows how the quotas have changed over time. Um, you've seen, you can see the results of the EU export ban in 2007, uh, leading to a zero quota, um, and all the way up to last year, um, where roughly a thousand tons uh, of bark were exported from Cameroon. So in terms of uh, um, sustainability, there have been considerable efforts to, to try and uh, manage Prunus sustainably in the wild. Um, and Mount Cameroon in particular has been a model and there's been major investment in management and monitoring plans since 1990. And stimulated by the, the 2007 trade ban and subsequent national management plan, um, there's been major efforts in ensuring uh, there have been considerable inventory um, inventories undertaken but also uh, management regimes developed based on uh, these particular uh, initiatives. However, there still remains a major disconnect between policy and practice. And an example of this is the annual sustainable bark yields have varied enormously, uh, and the quotas have various, varied enormously, and recommendations have been uh, in orders of magnitude different in terms of what constitutes sustainable. Um, and you can actually see from this slide that um, the Mount Cameroon um, community harvest of Prunus africana bark was only 57 tonnes in 2002 because that's all they could actually find. In terms of the National Management Plan, uh, this was uh, commissioned by FAO um, 2C4 um, and we led the development of this management plan with a number of partners. But this really, as the lead author of the, the um, report acknowledges, um, this forced actors to work together to brick a large new governance arrangements which basically meant that people who were not working on the Prunus africana issue uh, and management were working together and previously hadn't had much experience doing so. One of the major problems that we had internally was some of the methodologies related to inventory techniques and quota setting uh, were not as robust as they perhaps should have been. Um, and we agreed internally that from an institutional perspective this bricolage was not good enough in terms of developing a much more cohesion and cogent management plan and harvesting system for Prunus africana. Because of that, there were many reservations about the poor quality of the report, um, and we 
internally recommended that it would not should not be released, um, but it was. It was uh, released to, onto the FAO website and became a tool for advocacy and lobbying um, for those who had vested interest in maintaining the, the wild harvest of, of Prunus africana. So in terms of who benefits, there's been a lot of polemic um, written about the livelihood value of uh, Prunus africana to harvesters. And you can see from this slide that um, there are very few active harvesters uh, on Mount Cameroon. Um, and the benefit per, per person represents less than one dollar uh, a day. Um, alternatively, the price per kilo, um, the, the free on board price, is six dollars. And this accrues primarily uh, to one company who have a relatively tight monopoly on the export of Prunus africana. And last year, they, this represented a profit of, sorry, in 2012, this represented a profit of uh, almost six million dollars. So the cost of sustainable management versus the actual benefits uh, are interesting to look at. We um, have estimated that the cost of the inventory that was undertaken on Mount Cameroon alone is actually twice the income of the bark harvest itself. So essentially donor aid is being used to subsidise uh, the private sector. And this inventory was only possible because of external donor funding, which I've identified, um, uh, the German Development Bank primarily. So why is it that, why would we subsidize an activity that is both potentially unsustainable and has poor livelihood benefits when there are many more uh, livelihood activities that could be supported in the region? We go to the issue um, which I think, think is fundamental to the entire argument of wild harvest versus cultivation, is wild bark harvesting unsustainable? Um, bark harvest is a shock from which many prunus trees do not recover, particularly because of the scraping of the cambial layer, which doesn't allow uh, the new bark to grow back. The demographic structure of natural stands shows very low representation of mature trees, and this is primarily because um, many trees were felled during the 1990s in the, in the gold rush, as it was referred to at the time, um, to ex export and exploit as much prunus africana bark as possible. And the overexploitation rate is, is actually more than 90% in many of the studied villages in Western Cameroon. And all of these figures are supported by um, scientific studies. Um, work of my own and, and uh, Charles Taco in uh, the late 90s showed that significant crown death and senescence happened in 80% of trees five years post-harvest. So we, we actually assert there is no scientific evidence to support that the, the supposed sustainable two-quarters harvesting method that has been propagated is sustainable. And here on this slide you can see three images uh, of examples of where wild harvesting is, is impacting the residual stands of Prunus africana. These are taken in Bioko and Equatorial Guinea. Uh, the picture on the left shows a species, an individual rather, that has been harvested three years previously and shows significant crown death. Um, this also affects reproductive uh, activity as well, um, which accounts for the low uh, regeneration on Bioko in particular. The centre slide uh, image shows a, a cut stump and the removal of entire individuals is a common practice in some harvesting areas, particularly at the forest frontier. And the third slide shows that once bark is removed, um, the, the, the remaining stem is susceptible to a stem borer, um, and it actually infiltrates and penetrates the, the main body of the stem and may or may not contribute to the, the crown death that you've, you can see in the, the left-hand side image as well. Um, and this stem borer often leads to long-term senescence and death of the individual. So is cultivation the answer? Now, Prunus africana can be very successfully propagated by leafy cuttings, and, and my colleagues at ICRAF have done a lot of work on this. Um, and even at the lower current low price of the actual bark, um, cultivation is a better economic option in terms of, of income, but also for um, the labor expended by local people. The planting of Prunus africana in, in agroforestry systems is currently compatible with many existing agricultural systems in much of its range. And because of that, there has been extensive planting of Prunus africana in Western Cameroon. And there's been a, a recent inventory of, um, of Prunus on farmland in, in, um, around, in and around Mount Cameroon. Um, and it's shown that, that there are large quantities of Prunus africana stock still available um, at the on-farm uh, site, basically. And as you can see from the, the figure on the right, in terms of uh, value to the, the farmer compared to the harvester, cultivation is actually much more profitable to local people than actually going out into the forest and harvesting directly. In terms of CITES cultivation and trade, what we um, want to present to the, the, this particular meeting is that we want to basically identify that local farmers have been cultivating Prunus africana since basically the 1970s through various uh, incentive schemes, but are basically discouraged in doing so by lack of access to markets. And we've met many farmers in the field who say that if they can't sell their product, they'll actually just fell the species and use the timber uh, for other purposes. 
So scientists need to recognize that conservation through cultivation can and should happen with Prunus africana, as is the case with other products such as orchids and crocodiles. So home farming of these, these particular commodities can actually increase profits but also reduce significant pressure on the wild resource. As I mentioned, cultivation can bring higher income to more people with considerably less effort and particularly when compared to sustaining uh, the wild harvest. And we believe that efforts should focus on phasing out wild harvest in the long term and focusing more on cultivation, particularly of on-farm material. So in terms of recommendations from others, um, GIZ and the government Cameroon put together a very neat framework um, describing how a uh, farmers could uh, exploit and sell prunus bark from their farms and I think this should be followed up. An annual quota for the exploitation and commercialization of prunus from Mount Cameroon in particular should be proposed to societies for approval and this should be scaled up to other areas of production. And I think that we should be focusing more on domestication and cultivation of prunus in farms, plantations and community forests which are managed by local people instead of focusing on purported sustainable wild harvest um, in protected areas and other areas that should be uh, basically not uh, harvested in. Prunus should only be planted at higher altitudes. It's, it occurs in montane forests and some mistakes have been made with, with cultivation uh, experiments by planting at lower altitudes and most of these, these initiatives have failed. Um, but also we should we believe that exploitation inventory should be carried out prior to harvesting. Regular monitoring should be carried out and farmers should be trained on good harvesting practices. There is considerable evidence to suggest that uh, a felling rotational system will be much more sustainable for farmers than actually harvesting standing bark. Some final thoughts on Prunus africana. A 2013 patent by a series of Indian uh, researchers showed that the active ingredient for Prunus africana could be extracted from the, not only the bark but the leaves and the small twigs. Now this has a huge impact for farmer income. If farmers were to manage cultivated prunus on a rotational basis by felling individual trees and replanting, they could actually accrue significant income from single individuals of the, of the species and this is incredibly important. But these farmers need more support. The, the Government of Cameroon Regeneration Fund don't currently, um, for example, uh, they should be paying farmers to, to plant material on farms. Prunus Africana doesn't fall into that category. Um, and ICRAF and, and CIFRA and other research organizations are very interested in resurrecting our, our, our research on prunus for farmers as long as the market is available for farmers to sell their product. And this is incredibly important. We also believe that investigating the potential of the Asian market, uh, the emerging Asian market, in particular China and, and India, should be further investigated. But my final plea, if you like, is, is, to, is to offer ourselves. The, the, the research that's been presented here in this presentation is, is based on many, many years of, of empirical studies and it provides a very robust evidence base. And we have no um, particular advocacy stance on Prunus africana. We just believe that the science is showing us that currently it's harvesting in the wild is unsustainable and the future of the, of the, the um, uh, market, if you like, for the income of the species is in cultivation and farmer support. And I would just like to, to make that plea to you at the COP to, to think about those, uh, the, the evidence that's presented here, think about the wild harvesting versus cultivation and the trade-offs uh, within. Um, and I'd just like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to present from afar and, and I welcome very much uh, hearing about your deliberations uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much.